Hello and welcome to the latest presentation of the Rift Valley webinar series. My name is Anne Kruijt and I'm the host for today's talk. If you're participating in the live webinar, you can submit questions or comments in the chat module of the Zoom application at any time during the presentation or ask a voice question by raising your hand once the presentation is complete. Today's speaker is André Soa. André is a PhD student in linguistics at Boston University in the Graduate School of Arts and Science. His academic interests include social linguistics, phonetics, phonology, migration studies, and understudied languages and language varieties. His biggest, cur biggest current projects are documenting Kuangs or Kalahari Kwe in Botswana and exploring microcomparative variation and affectionate kingship constructions across southbound two languages, which seem to rely on inalienable syntactic structures. Please join me in welcoming Andre as he gives his talk possible Kwe contact with Afro-Asiatic languages, systematic click sibilant correspondences. Andre, the floor um, is yours. Thank you, Anne. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, good morning or good afternoon. Um, today, I'll be discussing a project that I've been um, doing on and off for uh, a while now, um, which I, I first began when I was doing fieldwork on Damara Kwe Kwe. Um, and that is mainly looking at possible similarities to some mainly Cushitic um, lexical terms, um, because, yeah, we'll, we'll see, you'll see why. So the Khoisan languages, um, most everyone here should be familiar with it, but just to recap, um, today we'll be discussing the Khoi languages in red um, and purple, um, which form, you know, what we're formerly called the Central Khoisan Languages um, in Namibia and Botswana, um, as well as we'll discuss Sandawe, some um, various proposals have tried to link Sandawe to the Khoi languages, um, even though it is up in Tanzania. And the other major group of languages that we will discuss today are the Afroasiatic languages, namely the Cushitic subgroup um, in light blue, um, and especially the South Cushitic group in Tanzania um, will come up in a bit. Um, and that is just to zoom in um, and see all of that linguistic diversity in Ethiopia. So why did I undertake this project? Well, when I was, uh, when I was working on Damara Khoi Khoi, I was a bit curious. So I was looking around at the literature and um, this was right around the time strong genetic evidence um, was published um, by two research consortia simultaneously in Europe. Um, two competing consortia found the exact same um, genetic tracing of Khoi groups, specifically Nama and Khoi, um, to East Africa. Um, and this, you know, the, the genetics were not terribly overwhelming, you know, it was like 15%. Um, so it's partial, partial ancestry um, from about 2,000 years ago. Um, but you would expect, if we take this as fact, we would expect some sort of linguistic marker from a significant migration like this. Um, so I set out to see if we could find anything. And so these are the types of graphs that we see. There, this is one of many, many alleles where we see that the concentration is in um, the Kalahari, and again in northern Tanzania. Okay, so the presuppositions um, there, the Khoi languages have had extensive contact with Kha and Tu languages um, to the point that many thought they were related. Um, a lot of this has been sort of disambiguated and teased apart already, specifically by Vasen, who identified Khoi specific um, vocabulary. Um, and whose work I heavily, heavily am leaning on. Um, and the Khoi languages have also had aerial contact with Bantu and Germanic languages. Um, so first, the first um, correspondence that I found was the dental click, the plain dental click with an Afroasiatic S. Um, so the word for sing or dance, and this is variable in in the various Khoi branches is C, and in Afroasiatic is Sidi. So this is an outline of the, the four 
terms that I will be looking at today. Um, there's a few more, but much, much weaker and sort of not worth discussing. Um, so Sing Dance um, is, I take directly from Vasan. And as we can see, even on the Koi side, there is a bit of variation. Um, West Koi and East Koi both have C to sing, whereas Koi Koi um, Kais is more of a the, the dance semantics. But Vasan does think that these terms go together. And on the other side, on the Afroasiatic side, um, this is sort of, I don't really know what to do here with this, with this one specifically, but Somali has siba um, for enunciate, but it specifically uses this term um, for to, to describe falsetto. Siba kolka la he sayo. Um, so there is some, some form of singing semantics that can be attached to it. Um, and a lot of other Cushitic languages use something that looks like sirp, siri, um, for singing and dancing. Um, and the variation in those semantics is found in most of the subgroups. Um, so perhaps here we would see something like C, the long Somali C, would have the S would become a dental click fairly straightforward. Um, the second term will be lung and breast. So here I make a bit of a um, semantic guess. Um, the koi word, the koi reconstruction here is largely used for breast or chest meat of a bird. Um, 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 both in koi koi and in kalahari koi. Um, and then this has been linked in the past to sandawe tina, um, which is also a term for breast. Um, but if we look at a, if we posit this um, click correspondence with an S, we find quite a lot of words for lung in Afroasiatic, specifically um, like oromo somba, which is lung, Shombo in, in Omatic languages, um, and Hadiya, for example, Samba. But then for the Rift languages, we have a Humpa, um, this, this pharyngeal H, which pops up, um, which might seem strange, but it gets corroborated um, in the next term, eyebrow, where we have Tams. Um, for Koi Koi, um, for Naro, da, uh, Vasan pushes these together. Um, and he posits Tao is the original, but perhaps the nasal might be helpful here. Um, but Iraq here, again, has this pharyngeal ace, He Mai, for eyelashes. Um, and we have these terms all over again. So the last three, I don't know what to do. I found them um, pretty recently in Bender's work when it was sent out, um, his reconstructions for Kushitic. It seemed close enough to include them here. Maybe someone has an idea of what's going on. Um, the tem, tema, tema. But as for the others, I think th those were the original proposal. Um, and then the last one, oh, Last one is suck. So this is onomatopoeic. This is probably the weakest one I'm presenting today, um, at least immediately. But the Sandawe um, data here, so we have the Koi data, boom, it's pretty strong. Vasan uh, pulled that all together. Sandawe again has a click with a glottal stop here, a dental click with a glottal stop, as well as the nasal. And then there is you, you find pieces of something that looks like this root around the Afroasiatic family. Um, Kabyle Berber was the clearest one. Um, and then there was this, so it, in Iraq, there's Du'um, which if we think about what the previous 
sound change was reflecting, if we move the consonants together, what do we get with a D and a, a, a glottal stop together? Maybe it would have softened into a dental click. Who knows, that, that's reaching, really. Okay, so largely um, plain dental click maps to something like an S or a pharyngeal H in Rift. Um, okay, the next series is um, the glottalized dental click of protocoi and an S followed by a vowel and the second consonant is a bottle stop. So um, generally the sound change that we'll be positing here um, across, across the board will be that um, Cushitic, the first two consonants of Cushitic will somehow be moved all the way to the front of the word and the vowels will be moved all the way to the back. And I think that this might be due to the phonotactics of Khoisan languages, which are heavily heavy consonant vowels, and that's about it. Um, so the first term here is dry, um, o, osa, which is dry or barren of a cow. So um, Vasen picks up, um, even in the Khoi group, that there is a double meaning for this root, um, both dry as in the weather or drying, you know, something in the sun, um, as is the case for Kalahari Khoi languages like chua, o, um, dry, pliable, which I think was talking about grass, if I recall correctly. And then um, in, on the Afroasiatic side, um, we see, so Aurel and Stolbova um, reconstruct a root that is S, E, pharyngeal W, and use a lot of chatic data to support it because there's an unexplained um, long vowel here um, that they argue has systematically resulted from deletion of some pharyngeal. Um, and this actually, beside their data, gets complemented by alagua, um, za'ata, which means barren female. I think, it, if I recall correctly, it was for a cow, but um, it would line, this, this semantic pair would line up with what we're seeing on the koi side. And then we have omadic data, shu'o from kafa, and ishwa from yemsa. Um, so we see something like if we moved this, these glottal stops over, um, the, over the right to the, to the other side of the vowel, um, you get these consonant sequences that could easily become click and um, complement sequences, it seems like. Okay, the second term for this series is hair. So uh, Koi has the word tung. Um, as in koi koi, um, and this is pretty ubiquitous in koi. Um, I don't think there's any argument there. And then sandawe has, again, a mystery like correspondence, u, if it is cognate at all, um, for hair. Um, kwadi, interestingly, has um, a great reflex here at um, om, or, Cotton, cotton for hair, and we'll talk about why that's interesting. Um, so on the Afroasiatic side, we have Iraq, which has ang for hair, and um, the Iraq, if if it is actually related to this koi root, um, would do a great job of explaining the nasality <clears throat> that we see on the U, um, as well as. Um, the kafa data also has this sort of nasality in it. Um, so in the kafa data, I take this from Abera's dictionary. Um, this is actually a ch followed by a glottal fricative. So chungo. Um, so we see a 
um, what looks like two things in the sequence. This bird is very, very loud. Um, um, so, so Kafa looks like it's somehow undergone this hypothesized movement that um, I'm positing for Iraq, where the H has already moved to the other side of that vowel, perhaps. Um, a mystery piece of data down here is the hollow. Um, we have a T, a glottal stop, A back to TA, ta ta. Um, this might just be a separate root. Um, it looks sort of like hadiya sarata. Um, but the quad, returning to the quadi data, um, you know, we, we can't say too much because we don't have enough of it. And um, Bonnie Sands has pointed out to me that all the clicks have become dental clicks in quadi, so it's hard to reconstruct too much. But it would be interesting if quadi reflects a koi, um, the koi root before a sound change where the, you, we're still finding the glottal stop on the other side of that vowel before it moved. Um, that's a very tempting and um, it would be very validating, but we probably can't make that claim. Okay. So the next piece of data is the word for edible worm. Um, so let's start with the koi data here um, where I'm motivating that um, the koi koi word tsirup, um, for an edible caterpillar is actually uh, trimorphemic. So we have this ru that appears on a bunch of insect, a bunch of insect terms. Um, so we might just want to pull this ru to the side and only look at this front morpheme. Um, the major term that made me wonder was given by Orel and Stolbova, it's e in beja, which is laus, semantics are problematic, and in oromosiba for worm. Um, alagua here causes some question um, because if we apply this rule, we could have um, the perfect, um, the perfect uh, sound sequence um, for the onset, we have this unexplained U, but um, I don't know if locust would be problematic here. Um, and then Sandawe finally has a few words that look like they could work here. Um, U for termite larvae, or Tsiga for spitting snake. Um, Orel and Sobova want to, to link this word for snake in Old Egyptian into this root as well. Um, and if we grant them that, then we can bring in another from Sandawe, but that would be pushing the limit. The last one I found very, very recently um, is the word for fire. Um, so e, so uh, this is protokoi e. In Damara, it was tais, um, no, tais. Uh, the orthography is confusing. So the koi koi here is written in the koi koi orthography. Um, there is a glottal stop here, ice, and um, ubiquitous in Kalahari. So there's no question there. Um, the piece of data that, so I first off found the beja, the, the beja data, an a, which is very strange. No other word seems to look like that in the language. Um, but the editors for Hudson also say that the field notes are very patchy and unreliable. Um, so the more interesting piece of data is from Iraq, um, where it's as, um, for smoke. Um, would, if we apply this sound change and put the glottal stop right after the uh, initial consonant, we get basically the correct form. Um, so we get this, um, yeah, so we have this systematic glottal fronting um, that's, that seems to be applying in Kushire. Um Okay, this next one, I have tried very difficult to find more than this. I found urinate very, very early on. 
Um, but I'm have this is the only one I found. Um, and it is argued to be um, a dental click, um, a fricated dental click for the protocol. And um, if we apply the same sound change, but instead of a glottal stop, we put some kind of laryngeal fricative, um, uh, we can see some sort of similar sound change. Um, this will be complemented by lateral clicks more strongly. Um, so it's tcham um, and saham um, might, be, might somehow be linked. Um, so tcham in koi koi, um, the, koi, the koi data here is very straightforward. Um, uh, Sandawe I included just to include it. I don't think this is related, but um, who knows? And the Afroasiatic data here. So we have sheyo, shuma, and then dahalo is interesting, sahau, um, aga, shah, and then Iraq, finally, soh. Um, so um, if we apply this, this um, second consonant fronting, we get tsho, and all of a sudden we get a um, easily affricated click onset. Um, it would be nice to have more than one of these. Okay, so in this vein, we'll look at the fricated lateral click, um, which supposedly might have come from the same exact sound change where we front the laryngeal fricative. Um, so we have three terms here and the Sandawe data, again, doesn't make sense. Um, I'm just including it for comparison. And so the word for moon, kamp, um, is only found in Khoi Khoi, first of all. It's not found in Kalahari Khoi. Um, and the Kwadi data here, we can you know, include it, kande, but there's probably not enough to make anything of it. Um, but here, the Iraq, um, predictably, um, has two uh, strengths here. So the, the first consonant and second consonant together produce the anticipated um, lateral fricated um, click. And also, we have this nasal coda, which would nasalize the vowel. So that would be, this makes the possibility of this panning out um, a little bit higher. And this root is found elsewhere in the Afroasiatic family, um, namely Semitic. So I just pulled Sokotri, um, Leche, uh, Seher, Moon, and Chadic also has it, but we're mainly looking at this point at South Um The word for dry in Koi is tho, um, and Vasan reconstructs this. Um, there is a question about naro, um, which is decidedly different even from its close neighbors. Um, that might just be a loan from uh, ka that looks quite, you know, it has the appropriate glottal stop and um, tenuous click, but who knows? Um, so we'll just assume that koi koi and sicha um, are representative of koi. And Afroasiatic here actually runs completely dry. Um, there's nothing that looks like it except for this um, rift root, um, hin klach. Um, and hin, I will have to ask, um, he sling and mos. Um, if this is not an applicative, because if when I was reading through the list, um, it appears over and over and over again, specifically for applicative verbs. Um, if we do analyze it as a separate morpheme, um, all of a sudden we have an analyzable morpheme for dry for drought or drying that um, matches the semantics when we put the applicative. 
and we get a nice um, continuation of our paradigm. Okay, so the final one is spear. Um, so the koi version is only found in Kalahari koi, khao. Um, there's many, many more than just Kui and Danisi. I just picked a couple. Um, and the rift one in Iraq was shah. Now, this seems like a stretch, but Kisling and Mos um, link it to Sandawe Sha'e for sting, stab, or hurt. And if this connection semantically makes sense, the connection between spear and stab is also not very far at all. Um, so, you know, maybe the semantics don't line up quite as perfectly here, but, um, but if we apply the rule, we get something that looks like it could have the same, you know, thing. The only unexplained variable here, apart from the semantics, is this O. Who knows? Okay, so uh, this is not a C, um, the glottalized lateral click is not one that I have looked much into, but I did find one, um, namely for bite between koi obe and irak tu. Again, um, the only the only correspondence for Afroasiatic is the Rift Valley languages. Um, so yeah, we we would assume if we repeat the sound change that we have posited so far, the glottal stop fronts, and we would get a glottalized um, lateral. So this is the correspondences so far. Um, there is a little bit of systematicity. Um, it would be nice to have more tokens for some of these. I admit that, but. Um, I've been working on this on and off. Um, so there, I was also looking at others. Um, I can leave it here for a minute. Oh, returning to yeah. So returning here, now that we, you know, if we if we buy that, um, Sandawe is completely unreliable here. This would make the ta'ata barren, probably not cognate, but in fact a borrowing from Alagua, um, given that this is actually much more systematic for the South Cushitic languages to have this form um, for a glottalized um, dental click versus a um, you know, sibilant vowel bottle stop. So in this case, it looks like if this theory is true, Sandawe would be the borrowing, uh, would be borrowing from South Pacific and not the other way around. Okay. So these are the ones I have shown you so far. Um, yes, this, this um, parenthesis is because I actually think that, must, that might be a borrowing um, according to this theory. Um, let's move on to some that are much, much less convincing, um, but with that I'm still working on. So the first is knock, hit, um, ko for protokoi. Um, there's nothing unusual about it. Um, it's pretty systematic. And a rak has kuhus, which if we apply this root, we would have a k plus a pharyngeal maybe that would result in a alveolar aspirated click. Um, Sandawe also has um, the word for knock, koko, uh, but that's also um, onomatopoeic. So who knows? This is work in progress. Um, yeah. Um, it could also be an interborrowing between Iraq and Sandawe, who knows? The next one that probably looks more impressive than it actually is, because I haven't worked 
through it, I've just pulled data points. Um, I'm trying to look at alveolar glottalized clicks. And on first impression, um, they were alveol, they match alveol palatal fricative vowel bottle stop sequences the best. Um, so here are some of them. We will not go through them in detail. Um, but this is sort of what I'm looking at right now. Um, specifically, the word no um, is very, very tempting with the oromo. Um, sechna. So we'll see. And then uh, Roland Kiesling had three words that he um, let me know. And um, he sent to me and Bonnie. Um, so Dabia salt um, matching koi koi dawes for salt lick, kwari year, kurib year, danui honey, dani honey. Now these, um, you know, seem very convincing to me and would have far fewer sound changes um, than the, the, than what has been suggested so far. Um, but it actually makes a fascinating um, tie-in into archaeological research that's been going on at the Kai Cha excavations, where they found a hill fort with glass beads um, dating to about the ninth century. Um, and they are pretty positive that it was um, produced and operated by Khoi people, um, predating uh, Great Zimbabwe and that there was some sort of annual nature to these um, trade deals. So that salt and years would both be important, but this is speculation. Okay, and that completes my talk for today. Um, thank you all for listening. Thank you very much, and for your presentation. We can now begin the question and answer section. So you can either ask a voice question or a written question. Um, so you can ask a voice question by raising your hand and then we'll send an invitation to unmute or else write it in the chat and I'll make sure to read it out for the recording. Uh, please remember that the webinars are being recorded. So if you ask a question, this will be part of the recording and it will be released on the YouTube channel. And there was already a lively discussion, I think in the chat um, during the presentation. So I think maybe we start there. And it had to do with, let me scroll back. Uh, Marijn van Putten brought up that uh, to him, Sombut does not look Berber. And Tura is a normal reconstructable word, clearly cognate with semantic riad, lang. And he later checked the sources and um, thinks that the language is not Berber, but an abbreviation for what Bonnie says is probably Beja. Yes, thank you for that correction. Um... Uh, there's some more comments in the chat that Hin is indeed applicative by Martin. Uh, Marijn van Butte replies that um, Berber is seen to know is also very attractive. And Bonnie is referring to a new dictionary, which is out for Beja. Um, so Once those again. are the comments, yep. Yeah. I'll make sure to save the references as well so we can send the chat. Um, and Thank then Marta was the first one to raise his hand, so. Uh, Thank you. It's um, yeah, very very tantalizing suggestions. Um, I I have a question, and this is an information question. You have this uh, this rule of prompting the final consonant, and um, maybe you can you can explain that rule a bit more. Because I mean, as you know, to me, Khoisan uh, is 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 a different world, and. I have difficulty understanding such a rule, but 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 maybe you can um, you can help me there. So, um, Khoisan phonotactics as an area are very very rigid. Um, it is one complex consonant and two more. Eh? Um, there is little to no room for any complex consonants outside of that initial slot. Um, in terms of rhythmicity, I was the the it really feels like those tumora are always stressed and that those 
Uh, let, let me think of how to do that. Um, so if you wanted to maintain these, um, you know, let's say phonemic distinctions of these consonants in a Khoisan context, um, you can't keep them in the middle, um, right? They, they sort of, there, there simply isn't a slot for it in either the Khoi languages or in the um, other Khoisan languages. Um, so if we're positing that any vocabulary comes from elsewhere, um, it needs to be accounted for somehow, um, like these bottle stops need to have moved or something. Um, that's my main point. Um, you, can, you can see it in English borrowings as well. Maybe I should have made that more clear. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so that helps a lot. And yeah, indeed, an English borrowing example would, would absolutely be convincing there. Um, I have another question, if I may, Anna. Yeah, uh, go ahead. The, um, and can I can I can can you give a hypothetical scenario for um, for for historical for for what you uh, propose? I well, the genetic evidence points only towards a movement of people from one place to another. Um, I do not know whether koi is genetically related to specific languages at all. Um, they very well might not be. Um, but with a movement of people comes a movement of language. And so we should expect with this movement of people that seems to have occurred, some words to have moved as well. Um, in terms of what exactly that movement looks like, I don't know. Um, I leave that to the archeologists, <laughs> but yeah, that's that's essentially where I am with that. But you 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 sort of suggest the idea of direction with the with the rule of going yes. from let's say Kushitic in into uh, Kwe. I suspect so. I think that's been the what has been said for a long time by many linguists, um, but. It would be fascinating if it was bidirectional, but I don't know either way. Uh, I, I, I think Roland and I assume that there, there is some influence of, uh, of, of early Sandawe on, on proto -Westric. Um But what I find fascinating in all your proposals is that um, it doesn't need to be Sandawe because I mean, I always only look at Sandawe um, but I, I find your uh, paper here so, yeah, so interesting in that it looks at at South Africa. So you you are getting now a little bit to to ideas of uh, <laughs> of what could have happened. But um, I'm I'm uh, I see then a lot of uh, if if. Uh, a number of these proposals stand up and stand uh, then 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 these are this is language contact uh, in which Sandave quite often doesn't seem to play a role yeah I, I was very surprised to see that um I was expecting it to be more systematic in any way but it doesn't it simply isn't panning out the Sandawe data where the rift and the Koi data does seem to be working out a lot more. Yeah. And, and your link, the clicks and the lateral uh, fricative adjectives, uh, that, that holds also in quite a number of cases between uh, proto West Rift and Hatsa. Oh, okay. I'm glad to hear. I see that Bonnie raised her hand. She also put something in the chat, but I think she wants to elaborate on that. So I first go to her straight. Hi. Yeah. So I the the uh, 
correspondences that uh, Roland gave, the salt and stuff, we could explain those as due to trade. That could, those kind of words could be borrowed even with very little contact. That is contact between very small numbers of people. And my understanding from the genetics is the uh, East African component coming down into South Africa might have only been a few families. You know, we're talking 20 people even, something very small. And so I have a hard time seeing how you would get very basic vocabulary items shifted. But my, my main concern is the methodology here is very much like that of Chris Eret. It's like a take a huge number of languages, a huge number of, you're basically comparing a huge number of items. You're looking at every Berber language dictionary, every Cushitic language dictionary, and any time you find something similar, even when the meanings are different, such as that star word, which is, you know, you know, you have to consider chance resemblance. Even though you're, you're showing sound correspondences, when you look at enough items, you can still get words that look similar. So how are you, how are you gonna respond to that? And I, when, one thing I would suggest is a statistical test. Take the same comparanda, just jumble up the meanings, throw them together, and then see how many similar looking items you get, even not uh, matching the meanings. And, and that gives you kind of a baseline of how many similar looking things you're going to find. You look at enough words, you're going to find things that look like. Well, Bonnie, I'm simply not there yet. This is very, very early on. I'm looking around. I found a couple correspondences. And really, it should be more fleshed out than this to apply a statistical test to it. Um, so these are these uh, ideas of two uh, uh, sound in a second syllable or later in the word glomming onto the top of the word. That's very similar to what Chris Eret claimed for, say, Hadza words looking like Southern African Khoisan words. And, and the implication was always, oh, if people look harder, they'll find more of these examples. And my contention is you find the number of examples that uh, chance is going to allow you to find. So, I mean, I'm not- I'll be chance. This is very, reason. that's a very reasonable possibility that this is all chance. But kind of my thinking is we can't know otherwise unless someone does the work. True, true. So would it make sense at all to either work with reconstructed forms or just with Cushitic rather than looking to Berber? What, what advantage do you see by going to a broader- set of Afroasiatic languages? Well, that's not my doing. I don't, I haven't looked at Berger, Berber. That is all influence from, from uh, Olga and oh, well. Sobova, Sobova. That, or Orella and Sobova. This is all stuff that I'm taking from them. Um, in terms of my own work, I'm looking at mainly Omatek, um, Somali and South Cushitic. Okay. When Chadic and Berber come in, that is entirely a citation from them. I mean, I, I do think that the, having a historical scenario that explains this <clears throat> and show, being able to demonstrate that it isn't just similarities due to chance are going to be what you need to get across uh, <laughs> at past in order to publish this. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I see that Marta posted a story in uh, the chat. <laughs> Would you mind reading it out? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, no, no. You can people can just read it. It's uh, the 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 year word is a little bit more complex than I mean the al Sukushidic links and the the tsaata word for the barren cow. I, I think that's very likely uh, borrowing from Alakwa into uh, Sandawi. Are there any other questions or comments for the audience? I guess just as a methodological point, it looks like you've found, found a word or two that suggests a correspondence and that you're looking mm -hmm. for more words that fit that same correspondence. Um, that just as a methodological issue, of course, one wants to find regular repeated sound correspondences, but 
to me, that also introduces a bias. Yeah, absolutely. You're right. Um, I mean, we'll see how far this goes. Um, this has been a project that I've been doing sort of on the side in my spare time. Um, I think there's a little bit here, um, but obviously, so part of, part of the limiting factor is that Vossen only created so many reconstructions, right? right? And Koi has a lot of a lot of consonants, and for a lot of these consonants, there's only three or four terms um, that Vossen reconstructs for Koi. Um, so that's one of the limiting factors. I've tried to get around that by reproducing some of my own. Um, so this one I, is not reconstructed by Vossen, um, this E, but um, that takes a lot more time <laughs> without the head start that Vossen gives um, in terms of ruling out um, borrowings from um, Ka or Ta languages or Bantu or anything under the sun um, that Vossen gave me a head start for, for everything else. Um, so yeah, one, one of the limiting factors is a very narrow vocabulary to work with. Um, um, so when you have that, you're going to look at the four, you know, of the consonant that you have and look, you know, you're gonna start from the list of, the, the small list of words that you do have and <laughs> work from there. But you're right, that does introduce bias and you're looking for something to make it work. And then, you, you, yeah, of course, in the uh, rest of the, of the word, the vowel, any other C2 or V2 needs to be accounted for and you don't have accounts for those in some cases. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, I think we've reached the end of the questions and comments for today. Uh, we'll take another brief look if there's no more hands, but no, I think that's it. So, so I'd like to take this opportunity to remind everyone that recordings of all of the presentations in the Rift Valley webinar series can be found on Rift Valley Network YouTube page and entries for each presentation are added to the Rift Valley bibliography. Details about the next webinar will be announced in the newsletter and it's going to be on Wednesday the 20th of October and the details will be announced later. I would like to thank Andre again for his presentation, of course everyone else for participating today, and I hope to see you again at our next webinar. Thank you very much for having me Anne.